This is <laughs> this is Brian Smith. Oh, He's gosh. up in Prince George, um, Canada, and he's an author and a fly fisherman and a fishing advocate. Uh, I met him at Dragon Lake, and he actually gave me two flies that work well. It's I'm, the only time I've ever been to my backing on my rod <laughs> was up Wonderful. in Dragon Lake with one of his flies. And he taught me how to skitter a fly, which I hadn't done before. <laughs> Okay, I'll jump in, eh? Okay. Yeah. Okay, just a quick introduction. Thank you so much, guys and ladies, for uh, having me meet with you tonight, because it's uh, it's wonderful during these COVID times to do this kind of thing. Uh, we've been running Zoom meetings ourselves. I'm, uh, I'm 75 years old this year, and um, I'm president of our Polar Coachman Fly Fishers Club up in Prince George here. Uh, we've been, um, we were originated in the 70s and we became a society in 1992 and uh, we've been active for over 50 years now and um, we've got about 50 members and uh, I'm the president and uh, have been for about 14 years and as Rini said it's really hard to get rid of the job nobody wants to take it from you <laughs> but anyways I've been doing a fair amount of fly tying I'm um, I'm also the author of three books. I published my first book in uh, 2009. It's called Fly Fishing BC's Interior. Pretty much a guidebook on uh, fly fishing around the central interior within 100 kilometers of Prince George in a circle. So there's west, there's north, there's east, and there's south. And uh, Dragon Lake in the south is about as far as I go. That's about 110 kilometers down. And it's a guidebook on... Um, Fun fly fishing up here, rivers, lakes, all kinds of stuff. And uh, yeah, it's been in print and it's been reprinted several times now and uh, probably in the 5,000 range, I guess, copies sold. Um, my second book I published in 2013, um, Seasons of a Fly Fisher. And um, in that book, I just, I took a year in a fly fisher's life starting in uh, March, April and away I went and uh, and uh, just wrote a book on basically a year in my life. And uh, that, was, that was kind of a fun book to do. It was not as technical as uh, my first book, but it was, uh, it was more or less uh, a recounting of a, of a year in a fly fisher's life. And um, last year, actually 2000, uh, yeah, what are we in? Yeah, 19, I guess. I, I published Essential Fly Patterns for Lakes and Streams. And that's a smaller book, and it's a little more technical book. It's got all of my favorite fly patterns in it, um, how I came up with them, who I robbed them from, and, you know, how I adapted them for, for myself. And uh, I uh, consider myself a little bit of a creative fly fisher. I've won a few awards, the Jack Shaw Master Fly Tying Award in 2008. I'm also a member of the um, BC Federation of Fly Fishers and I'm a director of, uh, of the organization. And right now we're, <clears throat> we're doing a lot of uh, conservation advocacy for, for our steelhead runs, trying to get some government response, but it uh, hasn't been simple. Tonight, guys, I'm gonna tie my, I call it my Smith Mikuluk. It was, um, this is a fly that was originated by Art Mikuluk of Calgary. Uh, back in the 80s, actually, and uh, art has passed on since now, but um, mine looks a little bit different, but basically it's the same kind of concept. It's a, it's a fly that's tied with uh, pretty much all deer hair and dubbing and hackle. So it, there's just three components to it. There's no ribbing or anything in it. Um, what I want to do is I want to, I've got to shine this light now, and I'm going to change my focus off myself. Um, but ask me questions as we go through this, guys. We've got all night. I've, I've, we've got no time limit or anything like that. I'd just love to hear you talk and ask questions as we go along. Now, Rini, what we want to do is get this back into focus here. Tell me how I'm doing. Okay. Um... Still need a light to tie by. Yeah, if you can lower your vice a little bit so we have that blue in the background, I think we can see it. You know what? Better. There probably, you go. Is, 
probably as low as it's going to go. Okay. I, I can't get it any lower than that. Okay. Is the lighting hitting it okay? I think it is. Okay. So I'm going to flip on my pensioner's glasses here. This is the um, this is the caddis fly that I've come up with, and it's it's very similar to a Michelux edge. I don't use the um, you know the canopy coming out the front end. Um, what I do is I just use a hackle, and um, I put antenna on some of them, especially if I'm going to do them for a shadow box or a showcase or something like that. But uh, the ones that have the antenna on them, I don't fish with them as a rule. I find the antenna just sort of gets in the way, and it's not necessary. Um, Dragon Lake in British Columbia is a very unique fishery. I don't know if any of you have ever been to it, but um, there's a lot of fellows from Washington come up every year. They've been coming up 30, 40 years. And uh, it's like, it's a lake that's in the city of Cornell. So it's surrounded by a city of almost 10,000 people. Uh, rainbow trout. So it's, it's just one of those unique lakes where you can... Uh, you can be in the city, you can stay in a good RV resort with, uh, you know, toilets, Wi-Fi, the whole works, and uh, be five minutes from the shopping center in Quinell and, uh, and go fishing. And my wife likes it because we, uh, we trail her down there and uh, she can go shopping during the day. She doesn't fish, so she looks after the dogs and, uh, and I go out fishing and day and night, whatever I want to do, and it, it works out pretty good for us. But um, Dragon is a very special lake. You grow some very, very big fish. Generally, the blackwater strain is in there right now. Um, there were some Loon Lake fish in there 30 or 40 years ago. I think they've pretty much gone, but uh, we have had a little bit of a problem with the goldfish population in Dragon Lake. Um, somebody introduced goldfish back, back in the 80s, and uh, with the climate change and the, and the warmer weather and whatnot, they've multiplied in their... Uh, they become a real nuisance right now uh, in the last five or six years. But our ministry, our provincial has put um, horsefly strain rainbow in there now. So the uh, horsefly river strain of rainbow is uh, very piscivorous. They, uh, they eat fish like crazy. So we're hoping this is, uh, this will be the third year. And uh, I was catching some of these on the dry flies. Some of the, um, the horsefly strain is, uh, it's got a very yellow tone to its uh, to its belly, and um, they they've been introducing them now into these lakes that have uh, coarse fish problems. And uh, I was catching some in the eighteen inch range in uh, October last year on the dry fly, and uh, they're actually quite a beautiful fish, and they're ravenous eaters. So glad to have them around. This caddis, we'll start with um, with the hook. Generally, what I use is I use a dry fly hook, and um, I use the Mustad R43s. Can you see that okay? That's actually going in and out of focus. Um, in and out I think of focus. the glare is on it. Is it? How can I do that better? Uh, better? Can, yeah, there you go. Okay. Yeah, I use the R43 Mustad, which is a 2X uh, wire, uh, 2X long fine wire hook. I think the TMCO 5212 is pretty much the same thing, but um, I like the fine wire hooks because I find that they, uh, they're not heavy hook. They, they float really well, much better than uh, say a, a 2X strong or something like that, like the Mustad 9671, I guess, or the R71 would be the equivalent in a heavier hook. But I have had no issues with them bending or anything like that. I even use them on steelhead flies for dries. Um, and, uh, I just find it to be a great hook and, uh, I use a size eight and for my stonefly, stonefly adults, I use a size six, but the R43 is a great hook. Um, this, this pattern is tied with, I can do it in several different ways, um, different colors as well. I'll use, um, I'll use a tan colored deer hair, which would be this one. And it would be, say, that one. Does that come out okay? The the light is really putting a glare on them. Yeah. Um, I don't know how you would be able to fix that. If, if anybody yeah. knows, just chime in. But sure. I wanted to say that um, Brian sent 
the recipe to how to tie this fly and I'll post it later on. Yeah, it's good. So, so you don't have to take notes really fast. Okay. So I'll do, um, I'll do a gray as well. So this is a mule deer and this one here, I don't know what it is, but it's probably not a mule deer. It's probably a white tail. And, um, but they're very, very different color. They're both deer and, um, the gray is good for the olive color ones that, uh, that you're going to find in the South caribou and whatnot. So if you're fishing lakes around Kamloops, I, um, I would tend to use the, uh, the green colored, uh, caddis, which would be like this guy with the gray and a grizzly hackle. Up north here, the, uh, the tan one is a better choice. I also use, I also use uh, elk hair. Elk hair is much stiffer and it's your choice, whatever you want to use. Uh, but the elk hair, elk hair is much stiffer than the deer hair. I've actually had uh, as good or better results. It doesn't, I don't think it matters which one you use. More importantly, it's, uh, it's the way you fish it. So those are the three colors that I use for the deer or for the wings and um, hackle, just good grizzly. Um, important that when you're tying this fly, and I'm gonna put another one in the vise here, is that you use, use a hackle that's smaller than the size that you would normally tie. Like if you're, if you're tying a size six uh, dry fly, you know, they usually, it's usually at least the gap of your hook for the dry fly hackle, but I use one smaller. So this would be a size 10, size 12. And um, what I find that does is it, is it stiffens up a little bit when I'm fishing the fly. And the different bodies that I use, I use Hairtron for my dubbings. And uh, the one that I use the most for northern fishing up here is this dark hair's ear, hair's ear plus. And I'll use that for the tan and for the gray. And when I'm fishing the caribou lake south of here, where they have the olive, I'll go to the hair tron in an olive color. And I like it to have that dazzle sparkle in it. Um, I think that just helps it. It gives it that that illusion of um, of beads of water and whatnot on a on a fly that's just just recently hatched, and uh, it it tends to keep it and gives it that sparkle. Lots of uh, advancements in dubbings these days. Um, saddle, like so. And uh, I like the tan color better than brown. And uh, that's the one I'll use for, that's the one I'll use for the tans. All right. Any questions on this guys? Please pipe up. I'd love to be able to, to talk, to know that I'm getting through. I'd like to listen to your questions if you've got some. Um, I have a question about the, the fishery and the bug. Um, Yep. For you up there, when when would you normally be looking for these big traveling sedges? And who am I talking to? Oh, uh, this is Stevie from Bend. Hi. Hi, Stevie. I'm good. Um, yeah, and you know, this is a this is a really good question, Stevie, because it does come up. I use this this fly starting in. I'm catching about ninety percent of my fish, my trout now in lakes on dry flies, and it's not just the caddis. I'm talking about uh, chronomid dries mayflies and everything else i'm a dry fly fisherman by uh, by heart and uh even though i've got thousands of uh, nymphs and leeches and everything else tied um to answer your question i start fishing this as soon as the ice is off in may and i will fish this right until november and uh i will i'll use it all the time um 90 percent of the time if i can't catch them on the dries i will go to leeches and things like that if i have to but uh for the most part, I'm picking the time of day for it. Um, what this fly does is it, even though it's not hatching on the lake, 
you don't need a hatch to get the fish to take these, especially aggressive fish. Um, if you work the shallows, I love working in the dark, um, especially early morning. Like I'll get up, I'll get up before the sun's up and get out on the lake and uh, the big fish are moving on the shoals a lot. And um, the way you fish this one is you throw it out, you know, get your 60, 70 feet out um, anchored for sure. And you're on to a, on a shoal. Hopefully you can get a drop off if you can, where you're going for some kind of a transition zone because you want to be able to fish in a circle all around your boat. And I'll throw out 60 or 70 feet and I'll pull it real hard, get it moving. You can actually, if you've got a nice still day, you can actually hear this thing go glub, glub, glub in the water. And um, that is the activity that, uh, that spooks these big fish to come in and grab it. Um, and the lake that I fish it with, I fish it in all the lakes that I've got, but I mean, Dragon Lake we'll talk about specifically. Um, but I'm in October, I'm up at, uh, I'm on the lake before seven o'clock. In other words, it's just starting to, just starting to get light out and I've got my motor going and I'm heading for my shoal and I'll fish for two hours in the morning and catch 10 or 20, 10 or 20 trout and go in and have a nice breakfast and then come back out later and then again in the evening. But uh, it's a really good early morning lake and it's a really good evening lake. And uh, Rini can attest to the evening lake because she actually caught some on this one, um, on the ones that I gave her in the evening. Right, Rini? Took it to your backing. So the action of this fly is what is what creates it. And uh, for me, it's called creating a hatch. Um, if, if I'm on a shoal on a lake or something like that, and I'm, I'm fishing, a fish a circle, I'll do it in quadrants, uh, quadrants of about eight. And I'm going all around my boat in a bay or something like that in 12, 15 feet of water. And I'm casting to the shore and I'm casting every which way. And, um, and I'm skittering it across the surface. I'm making it work, making it move. Very seldom that they take it, unless you can see a rise, and you throw it into a rise, the fish will come at it right away. But if, um, if there's nothing rising, I just throw it out and I bring it in halfway, say 30 feet. And if nothing, nothing happens to attack it, I pick up that 30 feet and I throw it to the next quadrant. And I just keep skittering it about 30 feet from my boat to about 60 or 70 feet out the longest you can cast. And on a dry line, eight pound test and uh, fish just hammer it. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, uh, you bet. Yes, yes, thank you. Can can I can I do it at noon instead though? I don't you want can to do it at noon. Work. Yeah, you bet. Yeah. I um but I do have my best luck with this pattern during during low light, low light conditions when fish are moving into the shoals. If you've got them up on the shoal, like you'll find, you know, early, you know, midday, that kind of thing. Yeah, they'll take it for sure if they're in shallow water looking for uh, looking for grubs and bugs and stuff. You just have to little, be a little bit more stealthy when the light's bright. Okay, good tip. Thank you very much. Lots of times I'm out there, when I'll be out there in October, um, it'll be so foggy I can't even see 20 feet, uh, but the fish will be there. If I know where the shoal is, and I, I know the lake well enough to know where the shoal is, I, I, I just get out there in the fog and... Uh, it's, it's better in the fog than it is in daylight. So it's just, it's just a crazy thing. Brian, um, this is Scott Herbing from Sun River. And hi, Scott. Hi. Um, and, and that fly of yours looks like a pretty big hairy fly. Do you also use stimulator patterns up there in the, the lakes and the rivers? Um, you know, Scott, I, I find the stimulator pattern is, is basically it's a cross between a stone fly and a caddis yeah. is, is the way that I look at a stimulator. And um, I do have some stimulators, but you know, I got away from those about 20 years ago and uh, I'm, I'm using more the real thing now, like a caddis for a caddis and a stone fly for a stone fly. And, uh, but a stimulator will work. It'll work for sure. Um, okay. Because it's basically got the same elements that this has in it. Yeah. Yeah. You bet your stimulator will work. Yeah. Any big fly, size eight, you know, worked around the edges uh, at, at a good time of day, 
and uh, they'll just pound it. But this fly, you can take it to any of the caribou lakes with the same thing I'm talking to you about right now. When these caddis, uh, when the trout, the big trout start moving up on the shoals looking for, for caddis during a hatch, this is a really good one to use. And it's also a really good one to use as a searching pattern. If, um, if there's anything cruising on a shallow shoal, it'll, it'll come after this thing for sure because it's creating such a buzz of activity. And it's the activity of the fly, in my opinion, that gives it its, its wealth. Great, thank you. Good. So let's tie one. I debarb my hook here. Can everybody see the fly, the hook okay? Is that okay? Yeah, it looks good. Is it okay, Rainy? It's out of focus. Good. Okay. <laughs> uh, as far as the deer hair is concerned, I'm a, I'm a real fan for this pattern, not the really, really long stuff. Like, you know, this one here is just, you know, I've used it for my caddis, but it's just a little bit long. It's much easier to work with deer hair that's a little bit shorter. Um, like, I, I would call it a medium length deer hair and a medium coarseness, coarseness, not a real coarse, coarse deer hair, which you get in the, some of the longer, bigger stuff. And the same with elk. And the difference between elk and deer is the coarseness of it. Elk is, elk is pretty coarse as it is. But um, elk is nice too, but the short elk, not the real long elk, it's a lot easier to tie with. But um, I'm going to use this, this deer here. And I just clip it to my, to my board like so. The thread that I use, I use a UTC thread from Wapsi. is the one that I like, and it's the 140 denier. Um, 70 denier is what, what, is what I tie with pretty much all the time, but when I'm working with deer hair, especially this pattern here, I like to have a stronger thread like 140 because um, you've got to be able to reef down on it pretty good so the deer hair doesn't spin around your dub body as you're doing it. So different colors. I'll have tan for the tans. I'll have an olive for the olives. And for the gray, if I'm doing a gray wing, I'm going to use the slate gray all in uh, UTC 140. We'll just build up a little bit of a base here first. And I'll stop this about, um, yeah, about a full eye length back because that's where my hackle and my head's gonna go. So I'm gonna stop that there. When you clip this out, I just put the tips of my scissors in. And the key to this pattern is not to use too much hair. In other words, you know, that's enough. Because what I want it to do is I actually want it to be on top of the hook. And I want it to not spin, not splay, but sort of just go in the hair so it so it kind of comes over like a caddis tent would come so this is my tail and uh just use my knit brush i use a knit brush for that if you have children that went to elementary school but they came home with head lice at one time the brush works great i'll put it in my stacker that, even it up. And I only want this tailing to be about the gap of the hook. Okay. So I've started my thread. I've left my thread up here. I'm just going to lay that right there, like so. With my left hand, I'll pick it up. I'm just going to tie this tail on. A little loose at first. Loose at the end and then tighten real hard. Um, if you tighten too much at the end, what will happen is your, your deer hair is going to splay all around the hook. So 
if you just use some light wraps, just some, just a light wrap when you come to the end there, that's the way to go at it. And what this basically is, for the size eight, it's four stacks. Um, if I'm tying a smaller one, like a size 12 or a size 10, which I very seldom do, but I do do it, I'll use just three stacks. But uh, this one is four stacks of hair. So what you want to do is you want to get your proportions sort of organized to begin with, right? Um, in other words, one, two, three, four, I'm going to put four stacks on here. And I don't need much all, dubbing at all. All I need is just, just enough for about two or three turns. Put some dubbing wax on my thread. Somebody talk, somebody question there? No? And I'm using this um, dark hair's ear, hair's ear plus. I'll just apply it to my thread like so. You don't need much dubbing. Take my dubbing twister up, back, up. Now take my thread and I'll just turn it just to keep my spacing. I'm just going to turn it about three turns up there. Wind this into a dubbing loop. And I'll take my first turn around and then up in behind the tail. And what that does is that lifts that tail up a little bit. It'll keep it up. Just three turns, that's all I needed. Now I'll begin stacking. So I'll take more deer hair. Just with the tips of my scissors, I'm just gonna go in there and pinch some out. A little bit more than I had for the tail, but not much more. Everybody see it okay? Into my stacker. It's a little bit fuzzy. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry about the quality. I just, uh, you know, it's uh, something that, sorry, this puppy came out of here. If I keep my stacker on a bit of an angle, you'll find that it comes out nice rather than leaving it all in there. So again, I didn't use a whole lot of quantity. And what I do is I'm gonna pinch it in my fingers like this rather than roll it. And I don't want this to spin. So I'm gonna lay it right on top. I've left my thread right at the end of my, of my dubbing. And I'm just gonna lay this right on top and the edges are gonna come right to the edge. And I'll take my left hand and I'm gonna pinch. My first wrap's gonna be eh, firm, but not tight second and third. Now I'm tying through the deer hair, okay? Not all in one spot. In other words, I'm moving my thread up the hook a little bit. And what that does is it leaves it laying, not spinning, just leaves it laying there and it's also easier to clip out of here. I haven't tied any of these for a little while. So. You'll see, you'll see where we're going with this now. Again, some dubbing. This fly takes, even if I'm hurrying, I don't think I could tie this fly in 15 minutes. It's a, it's a 20 minute tie. So that's only three an hour, but uh, you can take, you can take a dozen fish on this fly, big fish without it. Uh, without killing it, as long as you keep it soaked. And I'll show you how to do that. I'm curious about why you're using a dubbing uh, twister dubbing noodle instead of just twisting the dubbing onto the thread. Um, I'm just more of a fan this way. 
you know, like I've seen guys tie, um, you know, and just, just put the dubbing onto the thread and away they go. But I like the dubbing twister. I like to get it tight. And it's just my method of tying, that's all. If you wanted to do it without it, you're welcome to do it. Now up here, I'm gonna come back up on top of the little bit. What I'm trying to get here is a little bit of a taper. In other words, I want it to taper down. Okay, so I've got two wraps there. Now off again. Yeah, it's just a preference that I have. Um, I learned how to tie with a dubbing hook and, uh, and that's what I do. And it does, does give you a nice tight body. Back to more deer hair. These knit brushes work really good. I don't know if you use them, but they're, they're a good tool. Again, better looking like that. I like to clip it so it's, I haven't got so much hanging out the other end. Again, I'm gonna lay it right on top, just where the other one ends, because I want it to be one continuous wing. Then on the pinch here, and my thread was tied in the right spot. So again, fairly firm and then really tight and work your way up the hook. With about five good wraps. And just sort of clean her up a little bit there. That's progressing okay. All of this deer hair going on there helps it uh, helps it float too. And at the end, I'll show you a little trick that I use for uh, keeping it float even better. Yeah, it's just it's just a habit of mine using the dubbing twister. It's nothing. Uh, I think it does a better job of keeping it nice and tight. Again, my first turn is up on top of that wing and then back and I'm tapering it down. This has been my go-to fly for oh, 20 or 30 years now, I guess, uh, for, for caddis, especially in the lakes. I use a different one in the rivers. I use uh, sort of a version of an elk hair caddis, mostly in the rivers. Again, right there, firm and then tight, tight, tighter. If you do that sort of walking the thread, what will happen is it spreads that deer hair out a little bit. It's a lot easier to clip than if you had tied it all in one, in one spot. So just kind of walk your thread along the body there as you're doing it. This is the last one now. And I've left myself some good headroom up there.
and taper this back down. It's working out pretty good. What I'll do at this point, so I'm just going to uh, do a half hitch there, and I'm going to take a, a Velcro brush. I'm just going to, this is my last wing, so it's easier to do it now than later. Just sort of clean up that dubbing a little bit. Yeah, just kind of even it all up a little bit. And I'll also come up here and tie off my most of my head. So I don't have to do it later after the hackles in there. And it also leaves a nice spot for you to put your hackle up against. Yeah, it takes a lot of time to tie one of these, but uh, like I say it's one of those flies that's well worth the time you put into it because it uh, you take a lot of fish. But uh, if you're a fly tire and you're doing it for money, no, yeah, I um, I do tie flies professionally for some of these some of my friends up here, uh, some of the doctors and guys that uh, don't have time to tie themselves, and uh, and I only charge about four bucks for the flies and. Uh, so that's 12 bucks an hour tying these. And invariably they'll give me the hard ones like these to tie because these are the ones that catch all their fish. So this is the last wing. And as you can see, it's got a nice taper to it. And I'm just gonna hang it on top there. Again, firm. I don't mind if this one spins a little bit, if it splays a little bit, this hair, this last one. Okay, looking pretty good. Try to smooth this down a little bit, just make sure hack will come out better. Well, the hackle I've got, again, it's probably, it's undersized for the hook. If I was tying a true dry fly on a size eight hook, it would be one size larger. I like to trim out my hackle at the bottom. So in other words, I've got it like this. What I'll do is I'll take and just sort of trim the bottom hackles off. What this does is it gives you an anchor for, uh, for your fly tying. And um, I don't know if some of you have had, had your hackles pull out and that kind of stuff. This helps quite a bit if you give it a little bit of an anchor and you tie it in by that anchor right behind and I'm going to put the flat side of the hackle to the to the eye that just gives that concave one to help the dry fly float a little bit better and I'm going to give this about five turns around right back to the wing and then one in front of each other for five turns if I was putting antenna on I would be doing that before I did this but uh, I, only, I use the antenna if I'm doing a shadow box or something for uh, somebody that wants antenna. Pardon me, I just messed that one up, guys. I'm gonna come back a little bit here. Too busy talking. Oof, a sec, I might have to take that off. Get her straightened around again. Want it to look pretty for you guys. Start that over again. Again, I just take this and I give it a trim like so to give me an anchor. Now tie it in by that anchor. Three turns, give it a little bit of a pull so that first couple of fibers are going around the shank freely.
four or five turns, you got her. Flip finish. Yeah. Under here. Looking pretty good. You can tie these pretty roughly. I mean, a lot of people have trouble with deer hair, but um, it doesn't really matter how these guys look. It's the action in the water and the floatability and all that kind of stuff that uh, that brings the fish to it. And um, this hackle will ride on the water fine, but if I've got if I've got a little bit too big a hackle, what I'll do is I'll trim it right to the to the hook shank. So what happens is that hook shank will the hook point will sink into the water and the fly will ride on its hackle. And uh, what you want to create when you're fishing with this is a V action. In other words, it's zoop, 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 and it's, there's a V wake coming out in front of your fly. And if it stops doing that V wake, it's time to change flies. Uh, let it dry, get a new fly out. But um, what I'll do with these guys is I'm a, I'm a great fan of silicone for uh, for dry flies. All of my dry flies get treated with silicone. Just um, like a UVX uh, uh, boot repellent. Give them a blow. Does not change the color at all. Dries in a couple of minutes, it's dry. But that really helps to shake water off when you're, uh, when you're skittering these flies on the surface for dry flies. And uh, I spray all of my dry flies with silicone. Can you, can you show us what the can looks like? Sure. Um, doesn't matter what it is, Rini. This is just silicone water repellent. Um, you know, boot spray, same thing. Um, silicone waterproofing. Any kind of silicone waterproofing would be just fine. And it, it works like a hot dart. And... Uh, so this is the box I take out when I go out on the lake and it's my, my set of dry flies here, uh, mayflies, caddis, a bunch of different caddis, but generally I'm, a, I'm into midges and I'm into, uh, into mayflies and that kind of stuff for, uh, for my fishing. Um, chronomids, I've got midge chronomids too, um, emergers and also the, uh, the adult midge. And I use those quite a bit too. But uh, when I get into the smaller patterns for um, for some of the lake fishing, like there is a small caddis that comes off. I actually uh, put one together that looks like this and I'll show it to you. It's one like this guy, um, whoops into the garbage box. So this is the guy here, a small cinnamon caddis that comes off on a lot of lakes and um, I'll actually tie it similar, um, well, not even similar, but I'm using um, say a hen pheasant uh, the wing feather has the right color for me and I I just put a tent wing over it like that and it's got a got a palmered hackle it's got a got a um, a dubbing of uh, say cinnamon and uh, and a dun hackle and just a tent wing over top and that's that's what I use for my smaller stuff. Ryan I have a yep. question. Mm -hmm. uh, do you use that silicone spray on, on all your dry flies? I mean like I, I do. Oh, okay. Yeah, every single one that I tie gets Is that uh, gets much longer. I mean, I'm wondering why. You know, um, well, it gives you the, the water repellency, and um, 
the water just shakes off it real well. Okay, I mean, it lasts yeah. longer, I presume, than, than any of the other product, general dry fly products. Yeah, I use, uh, I also use uh, gink, Gerke's gink as well, but I'll, sp I'll spray them with silicone. And I, I've really found that it, it makes a heck of a difference in the floatability of the fly and the, the amount of time you can reuse it and keep it on the water. Okay. Doesn't change the color at all. Uh, my mayflies, um, caddis, anything, anything I tie for a dry fly for floating, I'll spray with the silicone. And I usually do a dozen or two dozen, then I'll put them, I just put them into, uh, you know, onto a sheet of foam mm -hmm. and I just blow them. That's okay. dry already. And then There's one a little bit of a question. smell. My wife comes down and says, what are you doing in the basement? You know, uh -huh. one <laughs> other question. And, you know, whenever it's convenient to answer this, but you mentioned dry fly uh, using coronamids fished as a dry. Yes. And I guess and that maybe that's very common, but I have never done that. And, okay. And, you know, just. Uh, Let me show uh, you one. Yeah. Yeah, we got all kinds of time. I'm finished tying flies right now. But hey, I don't want to take everyone's time, but. Oh, I don't know. Questions. questions are how it gets done. So this is what I would call my uh, my bomber. Right here. Okay. Put it in a vise. I don't know if you can see it better in the vise or not. But basically, it's got a deer hair back on it, and okay. what this what this um, shows off is your emerging coronamid. Okay. And I'll tie these down to a size eighteen. Okay. And if I wanted to go even smaller, I could get right down to the little wee midges of size twenty and twenty two. Mm -hmm. So, I use some um, goose quill for the body. Okay. Mm -hmm. So gray goose on the body there. Or in this case, I've used pheasant tail because I'm matching the brown adult. But if I'm doing the gray, I'll use a gray goose quill. And I'll just take a couple of barbs off a wing and I'll just wrap that on for the body. Okay. And it's just deer hair over the top. So you got a short tail of deer hair. What that represents is the shuck. Uh -huh. It's being, you know, shuck that's left on the surface, the cronum attaching and it's becoming airborne. And I'll just do a couple of turns of grizzly on the front there. Of what? Grizzly hackle. Oh, grizzly hackle. Sure. Yeah, it's just grizzly. Yeah. Okay. But um, what yeah. size? You said that's a, uh, you'll do it in eighteen. Is that an eighteen standard length and an eighteen short? I mean, I'm just curious. Yeah, I um, I, I like actually the uh, again, I use that same same hook pattern. I use the R43 Mustad, and um, I've got them in a 16, 14, 12, 10 eight grade down to six. So okay. commonly a 14, 16, but I'll go as small as an 18, but um, I'll use that a uh, little bit longer shank. So let's say a size 14 shank, size 16 shank. 16 is a nice match for it, especially in the longer shank hook. And it's a dry fly hook, so it, uh, okay. it floats better. Yeah. I'm gonna have to try that, thank you. Yeah, if, um, if you're into a good chronomid hatch and you'll find at the end of a chronomid hatch is usually when the, the trout will start taking the cat, the cat or the chronomid adult. Mm -hmm. So that's one to put on the dry. Like you'll okay. be fishing a chronomid again. You could keep your chronomid out there, but just put a, get your other dry fly rod. And when you f see fish starting to move around and rise for the uh, adult midges, mm -hmm. throw one of these on, you'll be catching fish. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you betcha. Any other questions, guys, about anything? Can you hear me? Yeah. Well, that, that fellow I was just talking to. Um, so I'm going to show you the emerger that I've come up with, too. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Hello. Oh. I just wanted to add this before we go. This is my chronometer merger. 
Can you see the difference there? Yeah, I think so. It, um, the light is so bright. It, the glare yeah, I'm, I'm really sorry about that, guys. I just, you know, I, I don't know what to do. But yeah, if you put it down, yeah, if I, against that blue, I can see it better. So if you take a look at this one, you see this is the actual emerging chronomid that I'm matching. Mm -hmm. So I call it my, my chronomid emerger. Um, what I've got is I've got a, a mallard for the shuck that's being left behind. And you can see the white, this is white ostrich for the gills. Okay. And then I've got that same body, like mm -hmm. it'll be goose quill or, uh, or brown, depending on what color of chronomid you're going to have. Mm -hmm. And then I put a little bit of deer hair. I tie it in right at the, right at the midpoint. I've got a gold wire, gold wire rib on there in very fine gold wire. Uh, Cause I want it to sink. I want, basically I want this to float and I want the back end to sink. So the wire helps it with that. And um, so you tie in a little bit of deer hair there. And then you put a thorax on it of say black or a dark green or an olive or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then you just bring the wing case over the top of it. So you've got half of it showing and then half sticking up. And yeah. what happens is this sticks up in the air. Mm -hmm. So it's got really good visibility and the back end is sinking and uh, yeah, that's oh, yeah. that's the one I use. Fish that? That's a really good. That's a really good fly when uh, when the uh, fish are smutting a little bit. Mm -hmm. And you Brian, don't see what is what is the name of that fly? This. Yes. Well, I call it my chronomet emerger. It's one that I've designed. Okay. But if, I'm trying to you... find find it in one of your books to see if I can uh, give everybody uh, a better peek. Actually, actually, it is in there. It's, okay. It's, yeah, it's in the book. Um, and do you fish if, that same sizes or do you go down in size? Or? Yeah, I'm actually, I'm not using the long shank hook here. I'm using a shorter shank hook. I'm using say, um, and I'm also using a curved hook. Okay. So what I use for the emerger is something like the Mustad C49 in a 14 or a 16 or an 18. Okay. So the Mustad C49, Tiemco 2487 would be another one to use. Um, but this is a really, really, really good pattern for uh, even in streams for a midge emerger, like a, an Adams emerger or something like that. Uh, mm -hmm. It's 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 really a, a good pattern to use, and it stands up like crazy. But uh, and the fish seem to take it when they're when they're smutting a little bit, when they're not um, when they're not going for the adult. But mm -hmm. you know, you'll see a little bit of a rise, and uh, a lot of times it'd be taking the emerger. Okay, great. Yeah. Something new to try. Thanks. Oh yeah. Um, I guess if you were to to call it something, has anybody ever seen the Quigley Cripple? Yeah, it does look a little like the Quigley. It's similar. Cripple. Yeah, it's similar to the Quigley Cripple. Okay. And to be honest with you, that's where I got my idea from. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I I got my idea from the Quigley Cripple, and I just sort of adapted it to uh, you know my light bulb went off, and there mm -hmm. I went tying flies. But no, you won't be able to find that in a shop or anything like that. But it's it's an emerging emerging chronomet that works like a hot dang. I mean, I fish a lot of chronomets, but you know, I tend to put them, um, you know, deeper. Oh yeah, you guys want to use the indicators now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but uh, but you know, when you're when you're doing that, when you're fishing that chronomet and you get near where you think the end of the hatch is starting to peter out a little bit and you see fish starting to smut around, starting to rise, just, um, you know, have a dry line ready with uh, one of those things on there and you might catch yourself another half a dozen fish. Definitely gonna try it, thanks. You may not get the big ones though. Yeah, the, yeah. Uh, the big ones are still on the bottom looking around for the, for the pupas, but um, it's, it's more of a, you know, one or two pounder type of fly. Hey, those are fun too. Yeah, they are. Yeah, especially on dry flies. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. Uh, I can show you uh, that, you know, you're who was the fellow was talking about the stimulator? Is he still there? Yeah, this is Scott Herbig. Yep, yeah, I'm still Scott? here. You want to see the stimulator that I use? My stonefly? Sure. 
Yeah, let me show it to you. Got a big one up here. So instead of a stimulator, I use something like this. This is my uh, my big salmon fly. Mm -hmm. What they do with my glasses. But um, yeah, this is my salmon fly. So when the big salmon flies are coming off in the spring, and uh, you know that's what I, that's that's my stimulator. It's uh, it's basically a, a salmon fly orange, and uh, I use CDC feather in here. Yeah. And then I use turkey as an overwing, and I lay that turkey flat so it's uh, laying flat on the body like a stonefly will, and it actually looks like a stonefly. It's got the orange in it. It's got nice olive brown mix of orange and uh and black and it's you know it's one of the scary looking flies but that's what i use instead of a stimulator for stone fly hatch but i think stimulators are taken more for caddis than they are for stones but they'll work in yeah. both hatches of course yeah well one thing i've learned tonight the next time i head up your direction i'm going to make sure i have a whole bunch of big hairy flies <laughs> Yeah, if you're going to dry fly fish, um, have any of you ever fished the Stalaco River out west of here? No, I fished the Blackwater uh, and, the, Blackwater. and the horse fly. Yeah, um, I've spent a lot of time on the Blackwater when I first moved up here 30 years ago. But um, in the last 20 years, I fished the Stalaco now. Um, Blackwater is a, is a nice river, but we had a, we had a real calamity there about 15 years ago when uh, when the fires went through there and the pine beetle kill went through there the black water just does not hold its water anymore it gets dirty in a hurry like it just it's just gone most mm. of the time yeah it's hardly ever clean um i go out west to a river called the stalaco which runs from uh it's only 11 kilometers long it runs from francois lake to uh, fraser lake it's um, classified water, so it's um, you know it's a classified water license, twenty bucks a day for for you fellas to fish it. But um, it's got wild indigenous rainbow um, population in that eleven kilometers probably probably varies between three and five thousand, and about twenty percent of them are over twenty inches. So they're they're really good fish, and they're wild indigenous. They've been there since. Uh, you know, 10,000 years or more since uh, the fish were populated there because uh, that's just a wild fishery. Wonderful river. You can drift it in a pontoon boat. There is a falls and a takeout about seven kilometers down of the 11, but um, it's easy to get around. It's, uh, you know, you can, it's got class three water in it, but uh, most of it's class two, class one. Yeah. Anyway, that's my home river now. And the Crooked, we've got a, a river called the Crooked River north of here about an hour. That uh, it's actually in the Arctic watershed and um, it's a beautiful little meandering river that's probably got more, more insect left life on that river than any river that I've ever seen in my life. Because it's, um, it's a fairly slow moving river, but what you have to do is find the gravel sections. And uh, again, we're talking about native trout uh native wild what was a huge first river again the first river the, the stalaco river. what was it the stalaco s-t-e-l-a-l-l-a-k-o stalaco river are, are both of these rivers in your book which i bought while while we were <laughs> watching you <laughs> tie flies yes yeah they're in my they're in my book yeah perfect um, um especially couple of in seasons of a fly fisher the uh the front cover is actually a, a buddy of mine from france that i was fishing with and that's his picture in the photo on the Salaco river yeah and uh the first book i bought that picture's in the of the Salaco river as well on the inside cover excellent thank you yeah, Mike, Mike says we should uh, have a Sun River anglers fly fishing trip to Dragon Lake. 
<laughs> you guys should do that. You know when I would come if you've got the balls for it is uh, around Thanksgiving, our Thanksgiving. So mm, anytime, October. After, yeah, anytime the last week of September, right till the middle of October. Wow, anytime in there. I mean, it can be cold. Man, what was the be... RV place that we were staying at? It's Robert's Roost. Okay, it was really nice. That that was yeah. a. Yeah, it's a great spot. Um, and it's not very busy there in October. It's only about half full. Robert's what? Robert's Roost. Roost. Okay, thanks. R double O S T. Yeah. Yeah. Look yeah first good. first class accommodation. It's probably the best RV park in the whole north. Yeah. And in the spring, Dragon um, Ice Off can be anywhere from the middle of March to the end of April, depending on the year and how much uh, how much ice is on the lake. But um, generally about two weeks after ice off is when um, a lot of the Americans from uh, Washington state arrive. The guys have been coming there most of their lives. That's when they come for about a month. So anywhere through the month of May, month of May, right until eh, middle, third week of June, pretty much guaranteed to go through about three or four different hatches of, uh, of uh, insects, including uh, chronomids, mayflies, caddis, damsels yeah that's when you're going to hit the big hatches if i was if i was to pick my time to go to dragon i'd go from the middle of may to the middle of june and i would go from the third week in september to the middle of october during the summer dragon just gets too hot it's not a really deep lake Deepest point is about 50 feet, and um, but the average is probably only yeah, 15, 16 feet. So there's a lot of shoal area. The whole lake is one big weed bed. But it is like city camping. I mean, if you want the wilderness experience, you won't find it there, but uh, it's a big lake. It's six kilometers long. So there's lots of room for everybody. You don't have to be uh, you know, all ganged up in one spot because the fishing is good everywhere on the lake. is uh, generally good everywhere what color is your boat <laughs> my boat is uh is a marlin yeah. no, that's a joke <laughs> Ten foot. we're yeah. looking for you we'll fish right next to you <laughs> oh for sure well i move around on that lake uh, if you can find fish moving that's where to fish but uh, if you can't find fish moving then just go to one of the popular spots and wait for them to come on yeah, yeah. We, we only had our float tubes when we were out there. So we were pretty much right around the boat dock. Yeah, you were, you were limited. Yeah, you were limited. But it was fine. Could. It was great. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you just went around uh, Bluebird, Bluebird Point there. Uh, that's that point off to the left. Like we that was well, it. Yeah, yeah, that's called Bluebird Point. Yeah. yeah. But I've got, a, I've got a bathymetric map I can send you if you want. Rini of Dragon. That would be great. And I could sell it to the rest of these guys. Yeah, sell it. Make a few bucks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So the fellow that bought my book, you found one online, did you? Yes, I, I bought it on Amazon. Oh, good for you. Yeah. You know, the regular book, the bookseller of the of the century here, I guess. <laughs> the century. What did you, which one was it? Uh, I bought the, the one that, that Rini was showing, Fly Fishing in Central uh, British Columbia. Uh, BC's Interior. Yeah, that's my first Interior. book. Yeah. That was yeah. the first book, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's got a lot of good stuff in it if you're planning a trip up here. Some of my flies have changed since then, but, uh, you know, that's 13 years ago. I've uh, redesigned quite a few of my flies from since I, died, I wrote that book, yeah. I, I would have grabbed that book too, but it's in the garage, which is quite a walk away. But um, yeah, yeah. Well, I think that, just that came out, was it two years ago that you? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, to 19. Yeah. 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 I, and, I, I, but I've got them. If anybody wants them, I've got them for sale. Just send me an email. I can mail them down to you. But Amazon might sell them cheaper than me. Not sure. How much you pay for it, Scott? I think I paid twenty two or twenty three dollars American dollars. American, yeah, it's twenty nine ninety five up here. 
Yeah. And my other books are twenty four ninety five. Yeah. Canadian. Yeah. Yeah. Brian, can you hear me? I can. Okay. Yeah, Raskus. This, this is this is Alan Stout. Uh, I haven't fished in your area in a, in a number of years, so I was curious about some of the lakes. Um, you know what's going on with fur and Owen Lake? Um, fur. Yeah, I've uh, I haven't fished Owen, but I've fished fur. Um, fur isn't what it used to be. It's okay. um it's still a good lake, but it's it's not the lake that it used to be. Um, a lot of the guys are going to a lake called Forest Lake now. Yeah, I've been there. Yeah, instead of fur. Yeah. But, um, fur is a beautiful piece of country. I mean, that's that's gorgeous up in the Chilcotin there. Yeah. Nice and high, you know, like um, basically don't get much in the way of summer doldrums or nothing. It, it I mean, it'll fish well right through the whole summer probably because it's up over 5,000 feet. Okay. Um, I haven't heard much of them lately. How's and, Forest uh, doing? Forest is the same as ever. Um, there's big fish in there, and uh, it has its times, and uh, it's got good times. It's got uh, got tough times, but uh, the fish are still there. They're good. It's uh, there's some big guys in there. Another one. I I, um, I can't go in there too much because my wife uh, likes to have uh, Wi-Fi and everything. Oh. So you know, yeah. Another one I, I liked was Jackson or Jackson Hole. Oh, that's a wonderful little lake. That was one of my favorites back about 20 years ago. And it had a winter kill about oh, 20 good. years ago. Yeah, a really bad winter kill. And uh, they've restocked it, replanted and whatnot. And I haven't been in there 15 years probably, but I love, I love the camping there. Um, there's Elk Lake and Kestrel Lake. They're right. fishing really well around there as, as well. Have you ever been to Bishop Lake? I've been to Bishop, yeah, just uh, twice, I think, okay. but not for 25 years. Yeah. I, I was there when it was, uh, when it turned on, when they found it. Now yeah, some big fish came out of there. Unfortunately, it was not much of a campsite there and it was kind of, kind of got run over a little bit. But... Yeah, it's not very big, that's for sure. No. Okay. You know, a comment on on traveling sedge patterns. I sometimes use caribou hair. It's brittle. Okay. It's got a really nice color to it. Yeah. Caribou and would be would it be sort of like elk, wouldn't it? Sort of. It's yeah. more of a gray than anything. Okay. Yeah, that would be nice. Yeah. Kind of a light lightish gray. Yeah. And then. Uh, I tie one with the caribou and then in the front, I have like a muddler minnow head. Yeah, right. Yeah. Rounded rather than the hackle. Okay. Yeah. And then when you when you drag that off the top, you know, it does make that nice wave. Just clip it. Clip it so it extends out the front end. Um, do you watch sport fishing on the fly? I do sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. yeah. yeah the the uh, Freskies are friends of mine. Um, Dale and I fished together for 10 years when he lived here. Yeah. And uh, yeah, he's a good buddy of mine. They did some wonderful shows last week on uh, Forest Lake oh, did they? Where, they were, where they were hitting them on the dry fly with the caddis. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They even mentioned my name. They'll mention my name. My buddy Brian Smith up here uses this all the time. And I thought they were going to have orgasms. They were having so much fun there. But uh, they, <laughs> it was really, uh, they had some really, really good fishing on, uh, yeah. on the dry fly on, on this. And then Don ties you the, uh, what I would call the real old time Mikuluk. He shows that on the bench. So if you can get that show back, uh, just uh, just on a few days ago. Um, well, yeah. Sometimes, sometimes I, don't, I get it on that World Fishing Network, you know. Yeah. And sometimes we get the episodes that are several years old. I don't know if we'll have to wait for it or not. But yeah, they just started airing. They they only just started airing these ones. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well. Uh, 
Thanks for your work. I appreciate oh. it. it was a great presentation. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Well, I wish I could get the lighting better here, but it just doesn't seem to work real well. Um, I need the Thank light you, to tie with. My old eyes need the light to tie with, unfortunately. Yeah, I know. It's just it, not, was, uh, it was good. It was nice to talk to somebody that's been in some of the places I've been. So that's. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, the world is passing us by, unfortunately. Um, but. Yeah. You know, you can still go back to these some of these places you went to 30 or 40 years ago, and they're still there, and they haven't oh, yeah. changed. They haven't changed a whole lot. No, I've been coming up uh, almost every year since 1971. So. Wow. Yeah. So, but a lot of different places than just around your area. So. Yeah. It's, it's been a, a great experience for me to see a lot of country now. Not too many people come this far, like come up to Prince George. Um, no. You know, I, I lived in Kamloops myself for 10 years from 72 to 82. And um, so that's when I actually started fly tying was uh, about 1970. And uh, I lived in Kamloops 72 to 82 and uh, really enjoyed myself there, but I just ran out of job and eventually had to move and uh, got transferred out actually again. And so then I ended up here, up here and uh, pretty hard to budge me out of here. Yeah. What we have here is it's such a varied fishing, um, you know, like um, an hour and a half from here, I can go fish uh, grayling in the, uh, in the parsnip system north of here. And, uh, yeah. you know, um, there's some beautiful grayling streams back uh, coming out of the Rockies there and uh, just gorgeous country, breathtaking and hardly anybody around. What's and, the access to that Stilaco River like? Paved road. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. And there's a lodge right on the river. Okay. So if you wanted to get together with a bunch of guys and, uh, you know, rent a cabin for 150 a night and split it three ways and you could stay right on the river. Uh, uh, yeah, he's even got a restaurant there that he opens from Thursday to Sunday. Sounds, kind of, sounds kind of civilized. Fraser Lake is uh, 10 minutes away, you know, for groceries and stuff like that. Uh, he's got RV spots there as well. And they're really good people, Irwin and Trudy. Yeah. But uh, if you Googled Stalaco Lodge, you'd see what I mean. Yeah. It gives you some sh shots of the river. All and I'm on, I'm on, uh, you could Google me too. And some of my stuff's out there. You have an email address? I do. Yep. Yeah. Um, Rini can pass that off. She can pass my email address to you guys. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I can email it to you. All sure. right. Thanks, Thanks Rini. Yeah, correspond. If you're coming up this way, you know, give me a call if you're looking to go somewhere and you need some directions or whatnot or some some assistance. Give me a shout. No, yeah, that'd be great. Appreciate more than willing. More than willing. All right. Thanks, Brian. Appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. I'll let the other guys talk. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I, I have to run, but thank you very much. Really nice presentation. Uh, thanks. I, I wish I, the picture, I know the picture quality is not as good on Zoom. It's really hard to tie flies on Zoom because, yeah. you know, you're dealing with small items, right? Yeah, yeah. it was just that glare, wasn't it? It was, it was a little. I know, hard. I know. Yeah, I wish I could do better. but No, I got it, though. So, uh, yeah. you know, thanks for the tips. I'm going to try to get your book. I'll, I'll uh, get your email address from Ryan. Sure. Here. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very yeah. much. I got to run. You Bye. bet, guys. Good Bye. to see you, Ron. Probably the best, maybe the best thing to do, Rini, if any of the guys want my book, is if they order them through you, I might be able to save the freight, right? By uh, Or yeah. at least combine some stuff. Sure. Because, uh, you know, it might cost me 20 bucks to send books down there, but I can, if you had a half a dozen of them or something, I could, you know, that's easier. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Be one shot and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and it's just as long as there's a coffee shop around whoever is ordering from me, I'm happy to deliver it. But you know, Amazon, <laughs> all, all I can say is, you know, even Amazon's, you know, mine would be signed copies, but um, yeah, you know, now Amazon get the signed copy from Brian. It's, it's kind yeah, of exciting to get like mail yeah. from Canada. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's exciting to do anything when you're 75 years old. <laughs> <laughs> As, well, as, um, as most of us are. 
Is there uh, any other questions for Brian while he's here? Yes, I have one, uh, uh, Brian. This is Lauren. Hey, Lauren. And I was just wondering if you uh, used that big, good-looking uh, uh, hair fly on uh, uh, slipping it across a steelhead run. The the big st salmon fly. Yeah, no, the the one you tied the caddis. It, it it would work just fine. Yeah, I'm gonna no. tie a couple of those up. But you know what I would do with it? Um, it. Tie it tie it like a goddard caddis. Okay. okay. Um, put the uh, get some um, weed eater cord, and put it out the front end. Okay. And uh, and then tie your uh, tie your butt out the end because it it'll that'll make it skitter better. Yep. Okay. But that that pattern it works like a dam. On yeah, steelhead. Yeah, buddies of mine use it all the time. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, you bet. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Brian, did I have you a question. I have a question, if I may, for everybody else. Um, since we're all down here in Oregon, is anybody um, seeing a lot of the big traveling sedges here in Central Oregon? You could get them at Hosmer Lake. There's some of her Davis. Used to be clouds of them at Davis. Yes. In the past. But um, it's not as prevalent, of course, as up in BC. Yeah. You, you're more mayfly? That kind of stuff yeah. down there? Yeah, it's more mayfly. Yeah. Or we do get caddis hatches, obviously, but yeah. not the big traveling sets. Small caddis in the rivers. Yeah. yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah, the lakes. Um, you need to. I think. I think the pH is a big thing for uh, for caddis. You know, you need lakes with really good good weed beds. Um, you know, extensive shoals and that kind of stuff. That's where that's where you get the good caddis hatches. And of course, the interior BC is just famous for that stuff, right? Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Steve. So, um, Brian, I was wondering if you had a picture that you might be able to send me of your steelhead fly with the weed eater cord. Sure. Yeah, I'd I'd be interested in seeing that. Just I might have I might have one, but you know you know the one to imitate would be. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll take a look and see. I, you know, I should have one for you, Rainy. Yeah. It's, it should be I've in got... your steelhead fly box, shouldn't it? It is. It is in there. I'm just wondering whether I have a photo of it. And if I don't, I'll take one. Sure. Okay. I'll send you. Yeah. I'll send you one. Yeah. That I'll sounds really tomorrow. interesting to me because tonight you've used two things that everybody usually has that we wouldn't have thought of, like your um, silicone spray, which yeah. I'm sure is a lot cheaper than the little $14 uh, bottle of floatant that we well, I use. The, I use floatant as well. But I, I spray everything with the silicone first, uh -huh. and then I put the gink on top of it. So, oh, yeah. my fly. No, you didn't tell the rest yeah. of the people that. Yeah, no. yeah, yeah. I, I did. I said I use gink okay. as well. Yeah. Okay, I use so dripping. you're doubling. I doubled. Yeah, Mike. Up. Mike mentioned that your fly floated so well he couldn't believe it. Yeah. That. Yeah. You know, and it caught a lot of fish. And it caught a lot of fish. We took yeah. it to Idaho. Well, so the the silicone shakes off, eh? I mean it. It yeah. kind of stays permanently into the fibers. And uh, I find once the fish slime it up after you've caught a bunch of fish with it, it's the fish slime that, that but you just dry them overnight and away you go yeah. again, right? Yeah, so, pretty much. Yeah. 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 Okay, well, the rest of you, I know that a lot of you don't have your video going, but um, if you have any questions, now's the time. And sure. otherwise, I will. Um, get the email address for Brian up to all the attendees today. Sure. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Brian. That was you're, a great presentation. You're welcome. If you're coming this way, just give me a shout. <laughs> and Brian, I have one more question. This is Stevie. Um, yeah. I was actually just taking a peek at some of your YouTube videos. Yeah. Is this fly you just tied, is it kind of similar to the one you're tying on the end of that Caddis uh, YouTube compilation? And I'm not sure, but I think so. Yeah, I think it's the I, one you know, that you're at at a show and you show two different yeah. flies. I'm not I'm not a YouTube guy. Like I mean, I don't. Uh, I mean, I've watched some YouTubes, but I don't do YouTube. 
But um, what happened is we had an outdoor show here about 10 years ago and um, I did fly tying and I was videoed and, um, and then he threw it onto, uh, onto YouTube. So I think what I did there was, I think I did the, um, I think I did the caddis pupa, you know, the emerging pupa. And I think I did the, uh, the, the Michaluk, but I've changed it a little bit since then. Not much, but yeah, it's pretty similar. Yeah. Well, I would just pass that out to the rest of us to uh, YouTube you and do Brian Smith. And then there's a, a caddis compilation. And I think it's near the end of that. It's very similar. Look, it looks like you might've been tying it in olive. Yeah. Yeah. So I might've um, might tied it a little bit different back then. This uh, tonight's meeting will be on um, the Sun River Anglers YouTube channel. So if you uh, want to oh, watch him tie it again, it'll be there. Oh, there probably you go. in the next month or so. Yeah, you recorded it. Yeah. You know, the important thing with that fly is, yeah, don't let your deer hair spin. Try to stack it on top. Try to keep it even and uh, and and keep your keep your hackle fairly short. Not not really long hackle, but just tie it undersized. And when you fish the darn thing, skitter it. You know, like. Give it, give it some real jumps, like work it really, really hard. Yeah, that's the key. You got to get awake and I can actually hear it going glub, 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 glub in the water when it's working right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, so thank there you. you go. Thank you, Brian. I'll be in touch uh, with you. Welcome. You're welcome. Yeah. This is, this is so much fun. Were you surprised when I emailed you to ask you to be a presenter? Well, you told me you were going to do it to me someday. So <laughs> think up some, dream up some other ones. We'll do it again next year or okay. in, the, in the winter or something. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. I don't mind coming on anytime. Yeah. All right. And who knows? Yeah. 10 years from now, I might not be able to do it. I might be sucking, sucking food out of a straw. Oh, come on. <laughs> Well, you should come down to Oregon one of these days. Now every everybody knows who you are in our you know, club, and we could all take yeah, you out. Yeah, I'd love to come to Oregon. Actually, we've got we've got some dear dear friends in Mech in uh, Denver oh. that um, that want us to come down and see them, and uh, we um, we've been holidaying with them in Mexico. Oh, for, uh, oh, seven or eight years now. We actually wow. met them in Mexico at the resort. Uh -huh. And we've holidayed together ever since. But the last two years, we can't go this year. We didn't go last year. You know, we've been stuck with COVID. But right, yeah, they're still dear friends of ours. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, we're kind of on the way to Mexico. I know we are. <laughs> <laughs> kind of on the way to Denver, sort of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you got to pass over another mountain range somewhere. Yeah, that's true. But then you could fish Montana, too. I haven't traveled much in the States. You know, people say that, but. I got better fishing here than Montana's got. Yeah. I, I, and I guarantee you that I do. That's the truth. Yeah. And so why would I go to Montana, spend 4,000 bucks in gas? Just, just to say that you were there. Yeah. You could go visit the, uh, what you know what? The Grizzly Refuge. Yeah. John Girak is my favorite writer. And, uh, you know, he's, he's out of, uh, ah. read his stuff. He's a wonderful writer. He's got about 15 books out. He's an amazing American writer. I think he's the best fly fishing writer in the world. But, really? Uh, oh, yeah. But he doesn't talk so much about fishing. He talks about life, you know? Uh-huh. Yeah, he's a good guy. should try him sometime. Okay. But anyway, yeah. Okay, well, you know, take, take care. and. I, I'd rather fish here than Montana, to be honest with you. But You know, I would rather fish there than Montana, too. But, yeah, you yeah. know, the odd thing was when we went to Dragon Lake, like how you said it's in the middle of the city or really close. Yeah that we had to get our i don't know if it was our license or just some flies or something but it was in a tire shop yep <laughs> yeah yeah it, um, yeah i know the one you mean yeah <laughs> at the top of the hill there yeah yeah he's got a good fly fly tying shop there though he's got, yeah he's got good stuff. it was just funny that you know it was the only, in a well, the only one shop. in town but it was nice that it was close i think i went shopping there for some clothes or something too yeah yeah. And, you know, I do love baked goods and coffee, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, I'll sign off. And uh, okay. thank you for um, thank you for listening to me for uh, okay. an hour. No, that was great. Thank you, Brian. I'll uh, be in I touch with you. Expect. Okay.
Okay. Okay. Bye bye. Thank Night. you. Thanks, Brian. Night, guys. All right. Let's see. Looks like everybody's almost everybody's signing off, but um, I thought that was pretty good. I was kind of worried because we weren't able to share his screen, but um, what a nice guy. Yeah, he is. So, yeah, I think that should be on our, our list. It would be kind of fun to, I know COF and Leanne used to take um, outings up to Canada. I think they would take three days to drive there and then they would, um, you know, fish for three days and then three days to come back. So like a week and a half or something. Renny, this is Alan. Hi, Alan. Yeah, I, I went up with COF one year and it was, uh, it was a good time. We, we drove up and then I was the only one from our club there, but you know, they were nice to me. <laughs> oh, good. But, but yeah, we fished uh, around Logan Lake. If, you, if anybody knows where that is. Is that closer to Kamloops? Yes, it's south of Kamloops. Okay. But there's some pretty good lakes right around there. And it, what we did was the group split up so we wouldn't all go to the same lake the same day. Oh, uh-huh. You could spread out that way. Uh huh. But it was a fun out. It was a fun outing. Now, what they did, they did it differently because they would do. Everybody would be assigned one to make one dinner during the week. Uh huh. And you'd have a partner to do it. But I didn't like that idea so well. I'd rather just do, do my own thing. But that was the only difference. But yeah. It okay. A, it was a good outing, and the uh -huh. fishing was good there. So. Yeah, we we ended up going to Dragon Lake. We we drove to Alaska, and then that was one of the places we hit on the way back. And and it was either late September or mid September, close to October when we were there. And when I met Brian, so oh, that's a good time to go. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was empty. Um, we caught grayling on the way. We fished the. Um, what is that part of, of Canada called? The territories of well, Northwest Territory? Yeah, I think that. No, was it the Yukon? No, it, it was the Yukon. But it was the anyway, Amcam Highway. Um, right. and then forget which one we took on the way back. But anyway, yeah, it was just a fishing trip and it was it was way too short. We had only uh, um, got three weeks. And it took us quite a while to get up to Alaska. We didn't realize how far that was. <laughs> well, there's so many places to fish in British Columbia. Yeah. You, you couldn't do it in five lifetimes, really. So. Yeah, I think you're right. And, and then the um, we had brook trout, the blackwater trout over there at Dragon, and then grayling, too, like he said. So kind of fun. This well, is, a lot of fun. This is Alan. Yes. Hey, Alan, we tried to find um, Horsefly River, but we couldn't find it. We didn't drive far how, enough. How could you miss it? It was a long way and nobody <laughs> knew where it was. So I, I kept on driving and driving and asking people. Nobody knew where it was. So I thought we must have gone the wrong way, but we just well, didn't you know go far where, enough. You guys were in Quinnell. That's where it's right near Quinnell. The people in Quinnell didn't even know where Dragon Lake was, which was the, well, that's the big, crazy. The big fly fishing place was uh, a tire shop. Yeah, that's what he said. Well, if you go, if you're in Quinnell, you go east and Horsefly Lake, but there's Quinnell Lake, which is yeah. huge. Uh -huh. Quinnell Lake is, has got three arms. One of them is 20 miles long. The other is 18 miles long. The other one is 26 miles long. And yeah, the Horsefly River goes in there. But the Sockeye travel up the Fraser River and yeah. they in the fall in September. We drove a long their, way along Quinnell Lake. Their eggs, and the big rainbows come out of Quinnell Lake and they go after those big rainbows and the eggs are there. Yeah. It's great. <laughs> yeah, we, we were lost and the only place that was open was like a little mini mart at a gas station and the lady didn't know. And so we were getting worried and we actually found a little creek and spent the night next to it. But, um, that was <laughs> that was it. We well, we ended up coming home after find, that. Try to go to Horsefly River in September. 
Yeah. And then yeah. you can use an egg <laughs> and you can get some good fishing right there. It, they're big fish too. Yeah. Well, we did we did fish the uh stalaco stalac stalacto. Stalacto. Oh, yes. I haven't been there. So that's, and we had to buy the special permit. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But we were the only ones fishing in that. Yeah. Until a little bit later, some other another uh, family came down, but it was nice. So, okay, I'm going to close close this room now. I'm glad glad that you came. Okay, thanks. It was a good show. Appreciate it. Okay, talk to you later. Bye. I'll maybe talk to you about one of those books. Getting one of these books. So. Okay. I'll get a hold of you later. Alrighty. All right. Take care. All right. Bye bye. bye, -bye.